everyone. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Real Talk Fishing with no limits. Today, we're going up to North Dakota to talk to good friend and longtime fishing educator, angler, guide, tournament pro, you name it. This guy has been around a while. He's been doing this. He knows all the ins and outs and has a ton of great insight. So it's Mr. Johnny Candle. Um, give us give some take on Devil's Lake, a little bit about his Florida fishing. We got coming up with Hummingbird Seminars. And just talk fishing business and the tournament world and where we're going. Johnny has some great insight. He's been doing this for a long time. He's fished all different levels and all around. You're going to want to tune in and listen to this one as we go up to North Dakota. Talk to Johnny Campbell. Hey, folks. Thanks for tuning in this episode of Real Talk Fishing with No Limits. I'm your host, Brian Bashore. Today, we're heading north. Talking to good longtime friend and uh, professional angler and guide, Johnny Candle. Johnny's going to tell us everything was happening up north and what's happening down south. So he's a uh, uh, knows it all what's going on all across the Atlas <laughs> right now. So what's happening up there today, Johnny? Oh, the wind is blowing. We got a, a couple snow flurries coming down, and I'm really asking myself why did I come home <laughs> so early? Uh, I didn't come home early. I missed probably the most mild winter we've ever yeah. had up here in North Dakota, but. Uh, no, I've been back in, in the North Country for about three weeks now, and man, uh, days like today, I wish I was putting flip-flops and shorts on and going out and chasing some big bull redfish instead of, uh, well, not that I don't enjoy talking with you on the <laughs> on the podcast, of course, but you, I think you know what I mean. We, yeah, well, you can do it from down south. Heart. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're fishermen at heart, and if I can have a fishing rod in my hand instead of watching snowflakes come down, I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty dang happy about it. You still got ice on doubles up there? Or is it slowly moving away? Yeah, we do. We do. Um, you know, I'm probably not the expert uh, to ask about ice conditions. I do talk to a lot of the, the fellows that guide up here quite a bit. Uh, sounds like all the guide services, uh, at least the major guide services, right? The Perch Patrols, right. the Bryce Guide Service, all the, the large multi-guide services have slowed their roll, if not shut down completely. Uh, just because, number one, it was a long season, and number two, it's getting to that time of year where it isn't all that predictable out there, and then you throw the winter we had on top of it. Yeah. Uh, sounds like, you know, still safe for foot travel for sure, ATVs most likely, but, you know, the key areas, Brian, and you're familiar with those, stay away from bridges, stay away from current, yep. and the thing people forget is stay away from that super shallow water, right? You you got a flooded roadbed that's only 18 inches below the surface. That ice is going to be much thinner than ice over 20 feet of water. So when you're going to and from your spots, if you are coming to Devil's Lake or even any other lake with ice still on it, uh, try to go around those uber shallow spots because they definitely warm up quicker and the ice disappears faster from there. So there's your words of wisdom from not an ice fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, but, people uh, want to know. Yeah. I think there's still guys looking to chase a little ice bite here and there. And uh, if you're coming to South Dakota, you're not going to get one. We are past foot traffic into boat traffic only up here or down here, I should say. Um, and fishing's it's kind of slow, but you know it's it's the river, so if there's fish are there. You just got to work it and uh, and slow. You can't right. put a presentation down slow enough. Well, you know, Brian, this this spring is going to be a year that may prove or disprove one of my theories about fish behavior. We normally don't get an opportunity to see this happen, but I still think that the length of day has just as much to do with where you find fish and how active they are as water temperature does, right? So we yep. talk about spawn. Uh, the fish spawn uh, when the water walleyes, you know, 44, 45 right. degrees. Well, that can't necessarily be true because I know plenty of bodies of water around you in South Dakota that are already 44 degrees and those walleye are not spawning yet. Right? No. So uh, I think the their calendar, right, they don't have a wristwatch. They don't have a computer to look at and say today is March whatever. They go by how long the days are. And those fish at Chamberlain, despite the water being open a little sooner than normal, they still think it's winter because there's only X number of hours of sunlight. So I don't believe their metabolism has caught up yet to what's going on around them in nature, if that makes any sense. No, so I tell that. It'll be, I... it'll be very interesting to see how the spring plays out across the Midwest, 
right? That Lake Erie tournament that uh, the NWT is going to, right? Uh, According to ice is off, they should be spawning. Well, then they'll all be post-spawn fish when you guys get there. And I'm betting that's not the case, right? It's Yeah, I think we've learned that if you go further east on Erie, you have a chance of, better chance of Mm -hmm. finding some pre-spawners. But yeah, they are definitely whacking them out there now and they're, and they're, they're, they're pre-spawned and they're fat, but oh, you start yeah. shaving a couple pounds off some of those 10 pounders, uh, those weights come down in a hurry. Those fish are still going to be there and they're going to be feeding. And we've had this several times at Erie where you're at practice, you're getting them some pre-spawners. And then all of a sudden everything aligns on Tuesday night or Wednesday night and you go back <laughs> out there and fish are still there, but you're like, they're these yeah. Mm-mm, there's no eggs anymore. <laughs> this yeah, your 40, 48 pound basket turns nope. into 36 really fast out there. But if that's for everybody, then I guess so be it. So, yeah, exactly. But yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Everybody's like, ah, water temperature fires at that spot. I'm like, nah, there's so many different. If the lake is still iced over in mid-April, they're still going to spawn. Exactly. I mean, it's ladies don't ovulate when it's 77 degrees outside. <laughs> Correct. Period. You know, or Correct. they don't go to labor. Or these things don't happen. It's just, this is this is nature. This is how it works. Right. I have, these things are going to happen at these times, regardless of the conditions. Yeah. Sure there's yeah, they things have eggs can... in them. You right. know, we start seeing egg development up here in Devil's Lake uh, in August, the year yep. before, right? And they have an incubation period. Those, I, I get it. They're not fertilized inside the fish, <laughs> but those eggs have to reach a certain point of development before that female is going to lay them because mother nature knows they won't hatch if they don't reach a certain point of development. Yep. So, and the, yeah, and so. I've been fishing Chamberlain, got another for a few weeks now, and I've caught, I was keeping track there. They haven't had, I don't know, 10 trips. We've got 90 some walleye so far. Mm-hmm. Very few, literally probably four, have been non keepers. Um, they're all in that 15 to 19 inch range. The bellies are soft, but I've had one male milky. Wow, last week. Yep. So I was like, oh, that's early. But then it's like, all right, you get one, you, they kind of start to come, right. you know, in order. Oh, that's it. For the next couple of days after that, that was it. Just just one of them. And he was nine, 13 foot of water, you know, somewhat like that. But they're moving like crazy. They're right. not where they should be. They're just <laughs> like, you know, Chamberlain's a pretty easy place to catch fish for the most part. They're pretty predictable. Most of the time. Because, yeah, most of the time, exactly. And you can go in the channel anytime and jig or troll and you're going to catch some fish and the shallow ones tend to be a little bigger, but find the little warmer water, big piles of fish. There's they're digging up blood worms. Their bellies are just full of mud right now. There's an occasional shad in there about that big. Um, but the last few days now they're showing up in all those predictable spots in big, big, big numbers. And they're cool. And they're moving to town real fast. So I don't know if you're coming to the shields fishing you, but when you guys get there, That'll be the same week we're in Erie for the NWT. You should have yeah. a, a heyday like normal, as well, long as it's not it's, blowing like hell. It's always fun to go to Chamberlain, whether you catch a ton of fish or not. It's just a, one of those cool fishing towns, right? Yep. They, they appreciate your business. Uh, it's a small community. Uh, being, being there as many times as I have in my fishing career, you know enough people there that you walk in any place to have a cold one at the end of the day and you see three people you know, and it's just a fun place to and go. And 20 of them that you saw on the water that day, they're exactly. going to come pick your exactly. brain. And, and you exactly. can just, it's kind of, I like sitting at the Cedar Shores at the bar and have my dinner in the evenings, and I can just hear all the of the scuttle of guys that recognized you. Some don't, some will come and talk to you, and some are just, oh, we did this today and that. Or then you'll hear the guy that I couldn't catch a damn thing. There's no fish out here. And, you know, and I just can't help so I'll be like, hey, go over right. here. Yeah, try this. Go here, do this, do that, you know, you'll catch them. Right. Yeah, we a lot of Iowa and Minnesotans over here because their seasons are closed. So you mm-hmm. know, those poor people over there that have walleye seasons, it sucks to be them. So they all have to come over here to fish till May. And yeah, it's just, you know, it's this isn't a lake, it's a river. These fish move and they move fast. So right. uh Devils, I didn't get to go ice fishing there. Got up there obviously for the championship last year. That place is just it's just it's my second favorite behind Lake Sakakawea. It just spits out fish, but it's well, a place you where you what. can do whatever you want. Yeah, it's. I moved here in the year two thousand. Uh, not not a native of North Dakota, even let alone Devil's Lake. Right, my story starts in Northeast Ohio. Uh, the son of a Great Lakes charter boat captain uh, on the central basin of Lake Erie. 
uh, I was fishing planer boards before planer boards were cool, right? <laughs> right. So uh, that's that's where I started. Uh, went off to college, jumped in the tournament scene, got to North Dakota, met a gal, uh, forgot to not like the gal. Uh, yeah. Ended up married to the that gal, happens. then unmarried from the gal, and now here I am uh, in Devil's Lake. But uh, 24 years now I've lived here, and what a great practice ground for being a professional angler, right? I would go yeah. off, fish a tournament somewhere, not have strong skills in, we'll just say, live bait rigging, right? A Great Lakes kid. Why would you ever pull right. a Lindy rig right. on Lake Erie? That's not what you do. <laughs> so I could come home after getting shellacked and pay attention to the, to the techniques that the winners used and go right in my backyard and find a place where that technique would work and I would just do it over and over and over and over until I'm like, okay, that's what a bite feels like. That's how much line you feed them. This is how you set the hook, right? This is how you do this. This is how you do that. And you could miss 20 bites in a day and tell yourself, you know what? That's all right. I'm going to get three more bites and I'm going to figure this out. Gonna, so yep. uh, I got to attribute my mediocre success as a tournament fisherman to being able to come home and practice any technique I want. Now, is Devil's Lake the best place on earth to troll planer boards for suspended walleyes? No, probably not. But you know what? You'll catch enough to know if you're doing it right or not. Uh, is it the perfect place to fish X, Y, and Z? Eh, maybe not the best place for it. But like you said, Brian, you, you name a technique, I can take you out here and find a location that we can use that technique and catch a fish. And probably more than just one or two, right? The, oh, totally. The lake is plumb full. Uh, Game and Fish, was it last winter, released their uh, forecast for the future couple years. And first time I've ever heard this in my life, but they did their survey and counted the fish. They break them down by size. So right. they have less than keeper size, which is 14 inches and smaller. And then what they consider keeper size walleyes are 14 to 20 inches and then fish over 20 inches. 50% of the walleye in Devil's Lake last winter were between 14 and 20 inches long. As a recreational angler, how, does, how do you go wrong there? That means every other fish you catch <laughs> is a keeper. Is a yeah. keeper. And you tell me one place we've ever been, Brian, to fish a tournament where every other fish that comes in the boat is going in the frying pan. That's, yeah, that's outside of Lake Erie, there's not incredible. too many of them. Right. Yeah, that's incredible. So lots of great years to come. The, the year classes, that 14 to 20 inch range was still very, very strong. Uh, and actually, you saw it last year at the championship. Uh, I live here and those numbers blew my mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lake Erie waits to win the tournament. Now, right. granted that that didn't go all the way down the scale, right? right? I mean, the top two or three guys had those 30, 35 pound bags. Uh, and then it dropped off relatively quickly. But, but Brian, five fish for 35 pounds, there's, you can count on one hand the number of lakes in the United States that you can do that on, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's not maybe. It's, it's a limited number of bodies of water that have fish like that, and we've got them right now. So uh, the future is bright. I'm excited for guide season. It's going to be fun. It's uh, going to be busy. The lake's going to be crowded because the good news is yep. getting out. Uh, but the saving grace is we've got 170,000 acres of water, so plenty of room for a lot of boats. So it, yep, it's going to be a good year. It's not low water, I don't think, right now, right? Or no, not at all. Average. Not at all. <laughs> yeah, those weights blew my mind last year. I think it did even, you know, every tournament angler that was in a tournament, because at practice you're not, you know, whooping on that spot. And you, all right, I got a 25 or a 26. It's a good spot. You know, and then you go there and you spend more than 20 minutes and, oh, I got six of those 27, 28, 29 inch fish here, you know, and they were just fat. I had a 26, 27 pound bag, I think on day two. And, mm -hmm. uh, you pull up, a, I had a 28 and then a 26 and that 26 looked just as big as a 28 in the water. They were so, I was east end so deep where they were eating yep. those perch, white bass, whatever, but they're not, these are fat. I mean, they are they're fat, round. fat. Yeah, they're they're round. round. I mean, that's yep. that fish weighed a pound and a half, two pounds more than it probably would have anywhere else. Mm-hmm. And you have 50% of those fish are 14 to 20. So I'm guessing, I don't even know, 10, 20% are probably 20 to 25 or 25 oh, to yeah. 30 or whatever. So. I would guess. I would guess that. Yep. That's a safe estimate. So uh, again, lots of fun. 
the ice is going to go off sooner than we're used to. Right. So my guide season will probably kick off a little earlier. Uh, I don't book trips before May 15th on purpose because most years we're still knocking on, oh my goodness, are we going to be able to fish May 15th or not? So, uh, But if the lake does go open early, folks can follow me online. I'll definitely let the world know when I'm out there fishing and uh, it's going to extend our guide season a little bit. Not so sure that that um, world famous fishing your waders from shore bite is going to happen though this year without a lot of runoff. Uh, yep. don't know if those fish are going to find their way up those running coolies if they're not running. Uh, yep. Obviously, there's water there. It'll be warmer water. Some fish will still go that direction. Uh, but I'm guessing it's going to be, you know, start the year off in the shallow back bays and, and then follow the warm water out into the main lake. And we'll go from pitching jigs and bobbers to bottom bouncers to lead core to jigging wraps. That's pretty much the progression. That's it. That's the progression. Year. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the way it works. So it is, but that's what's awesome about that lake. That's why Sakakuya, Devils, yeah. And Bago. Most people don't like Bago. I like Bago, but there's something they all three have in common. Sarkakui is just because I just have done well every time I'm there. It's oh, hard and, not to and like it's a lake. Beautiful that you body of water, right? What, it is. How can you not like fishing right. on and that it's, great and landscape? I, and I just say, well, that just encompasses the entire Missouri River from top to bottom. Right. But you look at Devils and, and uh, Bago, those are fisheries where you can fish, you know, tournament wise, you can fish to your strength. You can go do whatever mm-hmm. it is you like to do, whether that, that may or may not be the winning tactic, but your confidence, which you know is. Right. The number one factor in tournament fishing. I can go pull bouncers. Exactly. I can pull flies if you want to, right? Pitch right. jigs, slip bobber, lead, open water troll. It doesn't matter. All those places have those. And you're going to catch fish doing all of them, which is what's going to keep you confident and in the game. Exactly. Exactly. So don't cut yourself short there on your fishing career at Accolades, World Walleye Champion. <laughs> to, was that 2012? It's been a 2010. while. 2010. 2010. Yep, and, uh, Dave Noble, I believe, right, yep. was your partner. Yep. Dave, Dave Noble Dave. and I, uh, that was the living proof that blind squirrels find nuts. No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Dave and I fished a very short time together in the MWC. Uh, him not being a full-time angler, the right. commitments of traveling the country and fishing. And as, if you can think back to that time, uh, the MWC was kind of in a state of flux, right? The PWT had just gone away. And there was a huge group of anglers trying to figure out what do we do next, right? right. Uh, at that time, the FLW was the only other tournament uh, platform as far as pro-ams go, considered a pro level. And it made no sense for myself at that time to fish the FLW because none of the contingency awards lined up, right? I could have gone and won a tournament and the guy in fourth place would have made more money than me because he had yep. the right boat and the right motor and all that. So uh, jumped into the MWC with Dave. We fished together for three years, and uh, I don't like to talk a lot about tournament accolades, but we had three pretty good years. We averaged a top 10 finish or, or had a top 10 finish in 65% of the tournaments that we fished together for those three years. Uh, almost got a team of the year award, missed by two spots but only by like three points. So that was really close. And then did get one World Walleye Championship out of it. So uh, I give all the credit to Dave because I obviously didn't have those results when he wasn't with me. But, yeah, he, I met Dave's a good guy. But, but uh, MWC no, was a much bigger thing back then, period. It was. I mean, it than was. It, is. it was. A lot, much bigger. Um, a lot more boats, lots lot stiffer competition. Right. I didn't know what the championship was. It still like a 40-boat championship back then? Yeah, it was. It was. Okay. And, uh, you know, they they have had a pretty strict qualifying matrix mm-hmm. to get in, right? Uh, the points were tough. Uh, th- their formula was a little different because it wasn't just get a top whatever finish. Uh, the points came out as a percentage. So right. if you did get a tournament with only 53 boats, 25th place wasn't the same as 25th place out of 150 boats, right? right? Weighted average. Yeah, they took that into account. So you actually had to earn your way in. So it was a a different time, a different place. Uh, I'm glad it happened. I do have a few trophies on the wall from over the years. I'm sitting here in my office kind of looking at them. Uh, You know, they all, I'd love to see all of them have the number one or two in front of the second number disappear. Right. I mean, there, there's a lot of those right, 17ths or 23rds that, you know, uh, but uh, I was pretty damn happy with myself after all the years I tournament fished. Uh, Brian, I never really got into the team thing. I didn't have a whole lot of help. Yes, I traveled with a lot of guys. 
over the years because that makes it affordable to be on the road. Yeah. But um, I know I've heard you talk about it many, many times before, too. Uh, I, I didn't enter for the professional tournament game to see what four buddies I could have help me win yeah. tournaments. That, that's really not what I think the game is about. Uh, I didn't like it then. It probably hurt me over the years by not being more of a buy into this team thing. Um, but at the end of the day, when I look at all the accolades, however small they might be, they're mine. They're, they're not yep. someone else's, right? Uh, uh, granted, we all have help along the way. I'm not trying to take anything away from any of my travel partners over the years, right? But when you only have two guys in a hotel room, instead of seven guys at a lodge, yep. uh, which which group of guys is going to do better, right? It's just the way it went. So, And um, I don't think there's any th- evidence. I mean, you can look back years and say, well, this I know this group of guys travels together and they kicked everybody's butt all year. You know, but it could all be because of one one angler as well. It sure you could know? be. But then it's having that. I strictly do it because, like you said, it's, we can make this affordable. Camaraderie is awesome. You know, you're hanging out with your buddies and telling fish, doing whatever. It's good. And having, you know, on our level where we have a co-angler, having someone travel just to help load, unload the boat, do certain things. Or if you're going to Erie or you need as many lines out as possible practice so we can dial in particular baits or whatever it may be on a trolling bike is great. But I'm the best, the best part about walleye fishing, you know, is, is figuring it out. It's the hunt. Right. And then figuring it out, the challenge. And I don't, you hear all the sound bites, but I don't, I can't catch other people's fish. You can tell me all day you're catching them over here doing this. And I'm that just right. tells me I'm not going to go there and do that because I've learned that I, it's not going to work for me. Right. So I just got to figure it out myself, you know, and, and we get there with the team, you know, maybe Randy's on something or Ted is, Hey, I've got this dialed in over here. I might try the same, you know, presentation somewhere else in a similar area. But I can almost guarantee I can run over right. there to validate what he's doing or just to try to dial in. I'm like, I can't catch crap doing that. It isn't working for me. So it's just, let me go figure it out myself. Yeah. In the 29 years that I tournament fished, uh, as you know, uh, maybe the <laughs> listeners don't, I bowed out of the game two years ago now. Uh, it was time. It just was time, right? That old saying, yep. when you know, you'll know. And yep. it was time. Right? It was just time. <laughs> uh, but in all the 29 years, I can think back to several times when a teammate did well and I didn't. Oh, yeah. And you're asking yourself, how can this happen? And now you drive home 1,200 miles thinking, did they not tell me everything? They were supposed to tell me everything. Maybe they didn't tell me everything. Or what did I miss that I shouldn't have missed? And then yeah. you're frustrated. Or on the other hand, how many times where you were the teammate that found the bite and you came back and spilled your guts, and now a spot that you might have had a chance to win on, you're sharing with four other boats. Yep. And the chance to win just went away because you're sharing with four other teammates. And uh, again, when you sign up for the National Walleye Tour, it's called a pro-co event, not a pro-pro-pro-pro-pro co-event. It's called a pro-co event or a pro-am back in the day. Yep. Uh, if you want to play baseball on a team, go play baseball on a team, right? You want to play football? There's a lot of team sports out there, right? There's even team walleye tournaments, right? right. The, the yeah. MWC, MWC or the AIM or right. the casino tournaments now, right? Three guys in a boat, <laughs> fish the casino cup. Go fish with a team. That's fine. But I really, really wish, Brian, and I know one of the things we talked about or you sent as a topic was the state of walleye tournament fishing, and maybe this gets us right to it. but. If there's one thing that might get me fired up enough to get back in the game, is if a tournament circuit would come out and say, absolutely no communication with another pro angler. Uh, that, then it's me against you, right? Like I the best no, world. Yeah, I have no idea if I could beat Gary Parsons, Keith Cavias, or you straight up in a match. I have no idea because none of us have ever fished against each other. Right. My knowledge against your knowledge, right? I, yeah. I never have. Uh, so yeah, would the world have been a different place, right? Would some of the names that we look up to right now in the pro walleye world even be names if they were fishing all by themselves? I think some of them would because they're phenomenal anglers, right? Yep. But some of them might not, right? And we'll never know the answer to that question because it's never been the case. No, nope. and we, uh, as the touring pros, we did ask for some of that 
um, to be changed um, to, mm -hmm. to limit practice days, uh, limit time off on the water. You know, basically you got Saturday, Saturday through right. Wednesday. That's it. Everybody. And you can't That's be on off for two weeks or right. two months prior. Kind of Bass World's been doing this for years. Can't Correct. communicate. You can't receive outside information. Can't talk to other pros. And why would you, right? Right. I, mean, I totally get it. So, and, and some of them still get hotels and lodges, houses together. But in right. the day, it's just, I did this and you did that. Now I'm sure they're, it's not hard to look at a guy's boat and be like, huh, you know, what he's, <laughs> right. what he's been doing all day, right. unless he's really messing with you and tying up different fake bubblegum colored whatever at the end of the there night but it uh no i agree I, I would like it that way i think there's a little less of it nowadays because we have so many new guys coming in that don't know anybody don't have a network right uh, right i think tom win win has basically right. done it by himself he's got a couple you know guys now because he realized just the traveling aspect of it you know but sometimes that guy is uh is super green and so doesn't mm -hmm. you know he you may not really be benefiting anything from him because he's learning right. but you know you're more right. of a mentor well and then on on more. the other hand right that guy has got to work so much harder right um is he shortening his career right is a guy like tom who i know briefly uh i've talked to a couple times i know his story but if if for him to maintain the level of success that he's having right now uh, you know he's on the water twice as long as everybody else there's 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 no way humanly possible he's finding all these winning bites in four hours a day by himself, right? So right. at the end of the week, uh, the tournament comes and goes. How exhausted is Tom compared to the group of guys that's got four or five anglers? And on a crappy weather day, they can say, you know what, guys? It's pretty nasty out. Let's knock it off at 2 o'clock. We need to stay rested. We need to stay healthy. And here's poor Tom out there all by himself going, man, I'd really like to be on shore eating a bowl of soup right now because it's cold <laughs> and nasty. But if I quit now, I just gave the field how many extra hours of pre-fish over myself. You can't keep that pace up, Brian. You, you can't. You nope. and I do it. We do it as fishing guides, right? Um, I'll, I've got a stretch right now in my book starting May 17th. I don't have a day off till the 4th of July, right? That's a 50-day stretch almost nope. where... I will do nothing but be on the water all day, every day. And I'm telling you what, on the 4th of July, I won't be out of bed till noon, yep. right? Because my body is just shot. Uh, it used and... to be about four days for me <laughs> in a row. And if I would come home, well, I was like, don't sit down. Because if I sat right. down, that was you were done. You're You're done. I can go much longer than four days, those, right. those spans. But 50, by all means, is it's exhausting. People don't it get is. it, you know, what it's. Your start, your day begins a couple hours before you pick your, you know, meet the clients, pick them up. And it doesn't end once you bag up their fish and send them home. Right. You know, you're getting ready for the next day. And this is, these are 10, 12, 14 hour days. You're fortunate that you're right there. You don't have a drive right. time. And you don't, don't have to drive anywhere. Right. Live in a camper like I do all summer because you're <laughs> two hours from a good body of water. But yeah, it's a freaking exhausting. But yeah. the tournament fishing, yeah, I, I agree with all of that 100%. I, I don't know if it'll ever, we'll, we'll get there or if things will change. Right. It's going to have to evolve some way to keep the interest, the engagement, right. you know, the stuff, and then to separate or spread the field out. Right. I mean, obviously we have the forward-facing sonar, you know, whole thing uh, playing into this this as well. And it's certainly it's going to help you find the fish, but you can't drive the whole lake with forward-facing sonar in no. four or five days no. to figure it out. So, yeah, do you right. have two or three guys breaking areas down? You mentioned driving home, and did I miss that, or did he not tell me that? What always got me was, <clears throat> you, if you're going to have team work with the guys, you obviously got to trust them. We share money because that's the only right way to do it, to keep everybody honest. And I should yep. be able to climb in your boat at the end of the night and, and go right through all your graphs, mm -hmm. see right where you were. But I shouldn't even have to because you should be telling me all right. that anyway. Absolutely. I mean, I've never had any Absolutely. issue with any of that. But it's always, you know, if I fish an area, <clears throat> nothing there. There's nothing there. And then the tournament's one there. Yeah, that's the you're like. It's like, damn it, man, you guys both fished it, said there was nothing there, and the yeah. first, second, third All just I came out of that spot. Right. What the hell were right. you doing? You know, yeah. so that I well, they'll I mean, I might get a tip, you know, from a teammate that says this. I still have to go get eyes on it myself and and visually because we all have different electronics and we all have different skill sets with our electronics. Right. Right. <clears throat> so well, let's face guy. it, Brian, sometimes the fish <clears throat> weren't there when you were there. That's true. And they were when the guy that won the tournament found them, uh, right? You, we both talked already about Devil's Lake, Chamberlain, and Lake Erie. We mentioned three bodies of water specifically. 
And I can tell you a lot of days where I've gone to the same spot guiding to see have the fish shown up yet because I know they come here every year at certain times and they're not there, they're not there, they're not there. And on the fifth or sixth day, you catch a limit in 10 casts. <laughs> right. It, you know nope. that, right? When those fish get to town in Chamberlain, they don't just kind of trickle into town, right? It, it's an overnight thing, right? They're, yep. they're not on the bank. They're not on the bank. They're not on the bank. They're out in 12 or 14 feet of water. And one Thursday morning out of nowhere, they're every fish that wasn't 13 <laughs> feet is now on the bank. So yep. uh, we, we see that happen, right? It, it happens. But, uh, you know, back to the tournament thing, one other thought I'd, I'd like to, to maybe discuss. Uh, maybe the right person will hear us talking and it'll get somewhere. But, right. uh, who knows? That's why um, we're called No again, Limits. We put it all yeah, out there, right? Yeah. And again, with no horse in the race, uh, it right. might not even be my place to criticize. But I'm going to because now I'm a walleye tournament fan, not a participant. <laughs> And I'll tell you what, walleye fishing tournaments <clears throat> kind of stink. <laughs> it's like, okay, there was a tournament today. Uh, somebody won. What did they do? What did they do? What did they yeah. do? Brian, the championship was in my hometown last year, and it took me three days of asking around to find out where John Hoyer was and what he did, right? And that yep. happened in my backyard. <clears throat> Imagine when the tournament is 1,000 miles away from somewhere, I'm scouring social media and I'm, I'm visiting websites and media sites and about the only tidbits you get are if you're very good at reading the cryptic messages that pro anglers include in their social media feeds. And if I didn't have a 29 year history of being able to see something in the background yep. or notice a fishing rod laying on the deck, you wouldn't piece it together then either. And the industry wants to know, well, not the industry, the tournament outlets want to know, well, why is no one following our sport? Well, come on, National Walleye Tour. Let's give me as a fan something I can easily watch. I hate golf, Brian. I, I am terrible. <laughs> I concur. I'm terrible at golf, right? <laughs> yep. I'm the worst golfer you've ever seen in your life. But when the Masters or the U.S. Opens on television and I flip through, I stop because I can't turn it off. Because the coverage is so freaking it's incredible good. that I want to immerse myself in a golf tournament. And I don't even like golf, right? Yep, I, yep, I feel the same way. <laughs> but yet, there's a, a, the largest, most professional walleye tournament circuit in the world, and you can't watch the tournament until eight months after it happens, right? Yep. Come on, folks. Let's get. I've got high school kids in my hometown that are broadcasting Little League baseball games live on the internet, and the National Walleye Tour can't seem to get it done. And yeah, I'm being critical, and sure, if they want to blast me or call me and say, Johnny, keep your mouth shut about it, they can. But I'm a fan now. I'm not <laughs> giving you money. I'm watching you, and without my eyes, the tournaments have nothing to sell to sponsors. Yep. So... They got to do something, Brian, to get eyes back on the sport of walleye fishing. So Robert Cardenas yep. does a great job doing the little interview stuff here and there, but he's one guy, one guy, 130 boats. You got one guy out there, right? So Come on. Robert podcasts with him drops tonight, actually. Okay. And we cover Good. a little bit of this and, uh, and that's what he plans on doing more of this year is bringing more video and some not necessarily live so much because the NMT we're allowed to go live on day two. Okay. But who has the equipment or the knowledge to know how to go live? Right. So you can do it. I was actually messing with it last night and it's, you know, it's, and if once you lose your signal or you drop it, you're done. You right. can't fiddle with your equipment to get it back on. And it has to be on a Facebook or YouTube. You can't, I can't stream it to my website. Like I had set up because I get it. They don't want viewership going there and, you advertise even right. right, right, not to them. So because if you live in it, they're probably going to share it over on their page. Yep. Right. So they're, I get what they're doing, whether we agree with that or not, whatever. That's a different story. Right. But and I, you know, a couple of guys have tried it and it hasn't worked. Um, GoPro, you can do it, but you still you got to have the Wi-Fi capability, and, and whether you got a hotspot on your phone, it's just you know the service. You might have it great, and then you take off and you get two miles down the lake right. and you lose it, and it's it's game over type thing. Um, I imagine you know, Drake Hurd and I talked about it a little bit too. You'll probably see a little bit of it this year, but overall, 
well, that guy suck at telling everybody what it what what they did. <laughs> exactly. You know, I haven't been in the first place position that anybody asked. I'm I'll I'll show you. I'll give you the freaking <laughs> white points. I don't care because it you, like I can't catch your fish. So good luck trying to go. They're gone. Mm-hmm. You know, by the time the info comes out, even if it's twelve hours later, you know, and the bass guys are good at it because they get it. You know, my job is to sell a shit ton of these baits. And the way I'm going to do that is tell you I won the tournament using, you know, this Z-Man three-inch jerk shed. Right. You know, and while the guys are, it's a, you know, and there was a little bit, they did some of that. They covered the baits last year. I think Robert did a little interviews mm-hmm. and they got, got some of that beware, right? It's cryptic. I got to watch the YouTube and go, oh, right. that's, there's a road there. He must have been over here. <laughs> right. You know, and figure it out. And it's just not on the, you know, it's. With the way we receive our news or media nowadays, if it's not, it's old news. Absolutely. You know, your old news come the next tournament, everybody forgot who won the last one. Right. So you got this short window of opportunity to maximize your exposure, your sponsor's exposure. You know, and then obviously if you can do that real time on the water, you're going to be, you know, leaps and bounds right. above everybody Huge. else. Huge. But you did, you experienced that with the head-to-head pro walleye series, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it. I mean, they had the right idea. They did. Good they concept. Did. It's expensive. I mean, there's a lot Very of costs so. associated with it, which people probably don't realize to try to produce that. And I mean, MLF, Bass, you know, they do it, but you have multi-million dollar production outfits doing that. You know, right. so you're talking to walleye guys. I, yeah, I got a $400 GoPro and a cell phone. That's <laughs> It's not right. the same level, people. Exactly. Well, there's going to have to be some sacrifice made somewhere by somebody mm-hmm. and a lot of somebody's right. And, and Brian, I'm not going to say I would have been the most amenable to it 15 years ago at the height of my tournament fishing career, either. If someone would have come to me and said, look, it's going to cost you $4,000 a tournament to fish these, but the payout's only going to be based on $3,000 because we're taking a thousand dollars of every entry fee and we're going to invest it in making this live. And you know what, right now, at this point in time, I would say, let's do it then, right? Because uh, honestly, I think walleye tournament fishing is on its like final breath. We're not on life support yet, <laughs> but, but Brian, it, man, we got to do something. It needs um, to evolve a little bit. It's, it's, it, it, 1994 was my rookie season. And with the exception of, a minor rule change to paragraph three, subsection F somewhere. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's the same deal, right? It's a pro in the boat with a, we called them amateurs years ago, and then people got feelings hurt. So we switched it to co-angler instead. Uh, but it's a pro in the boat with a co in the boat. And the pro's job is to help the co catch more fish. So it helps the pro's weight, but not every pro does that. Some pros choose to try to catch them all themselves. Uh, So myself as a pro trying to teach, gave up half my time teaching instead of catching. Uh, And then co's go talk to other co's overnight. Uh, Even if the pros aren't sharing, we've got co's talking to other co's. And then you've got boats showing up where they might not have, should have been the next day, blah, 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 blah. The, The coverage isn't there. I don't even want to go into the whole uh, not playing by the rules scandals that we've had the last couple of years, right? I mean, yeah, uh, I, it's been a crap storm, right? It's I, I've been Complete. watching this as the the man on the other side of the glass now for two years, almost three, and I'm starting to go, gee, I understand why people don't really want to follow what's going on. And it, it was hard. I didn't see any of it, Brian, when I was fishing on the pro side. Yeah. Right? I, I'm like, you guys are crazy. We put on a hell of a show. We do a great job. We do all we do all these things and we do this and we do that. And I shouldn't have been saying we. I should have been saying I. Because now that I'm on the outside looking in, there are a handful of people doing it the right way, right? Yourself with a podcast, right? Uh, the, some of the other guys that have great social media pages and they're out there doing x y and z but man i can rattle off quite a few names that we would all consider top 10 walleye anglers that i haven't seen a peep on their social media page since deer hunting season was over and the last 10 posts they made were about the deer they shot so uh come on guys fish walleye fishing doesn't die when the devil's lake tournament was over Right. Come on. Right. Give us some 
give us some pointers on right rigging rods or what line I need to use or new hot baits or you know getting ready for the season and and like I said Brian you're you're one of the guys that does it right you're you're out there you're you've got your tackle tip Tuesdays and all that stuff right see I actually follow this stuff right <laughs> I'm a junkie I'm a just because I'm not tournament fishing doesn't mean I'm not still a walleye oh, yeah. tournament junkie and I'm trying to find the information and can't find it so how are we ever going to get the casual fan converted to a diehard walleye tournament junkie if the stuff is not readily available right so I'm just urging anyone listening, uh, right, wrong, or other, uh, to just like one more post a week, right? Just yep. give me one or, more post. Or just a one a week, right? <laughs> yeah. And just think, Brian, if a hundred NWT pros posted once a week about walleye fishing, where would that take the game, right? Once a week, hundred posts a week about the National Walleye Tour, where would that yeah, get? Yeah, just us? having wow. Cardenas hired just to do that. Have right. a, have a, it shot it straight up. I and mean, we have a record yep. number of co's signed up again. Oh, yeah. So yep. many that have signed up for all four events that they don't even guaranteed entry because they don't right. know how many, you know, they can't right. guarantee it because they don't know how many pros, but they had to put a cutoff. But it sounds like there's a hundred and, you know, 20, 50 plus guys in it. You know, four hours in, it was like full. That's so awesome. The guys that are trying That's to awesome. just do one or right. two tournaments aren't probably aren't going right. to get in. Um, right, but now no, we no. got to get past the codes to the fans. Yeah. Now we need to get right. we need to get the pro signed up so these codes <laughs> right. get in. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, we got to get to the fans, and and uh, you know Robert's been doing it great. But if each angle, oh, he, like you said, he does do awesome it themselves. Job. He does. You know, if yep. everybody else will just pitch in a little bit here and there and do something. <clears throat> you figure each person has a thousand followers, right? I mean, right. that's a hundred thousand people. Right. It's just that's. I mean, you're touching. Granted, a lot of them are the same, but there's several that have, you know, 10 or 20,000 followers right. Uh, right. on the social stuff, you know, outside of their other channels and their, and their websites and whatever. But I think you and I come from a different cloth of being guides too, where you, maybe you had this issue and you kind of touched on it with having a co-angler is you had to teach that person, right? You're trying to, Correct. and I'm not guiding today. I'm tournament fishing today. <laughs> so it totally, what it always messed with me is, I, I got to keep this guy on fish. I got to get, no, he's not your client. I don't have to right. get you on fish. I, I want to get you on fish because you're going right. to help out the weight of the boat. <clears throat> but it's always something I struggled with was making sure that he was having a good day and he was happy. And, but then I came to a point where I said, Hey, not, everything that happens, don't take nothing personal. This is my job. Right. This is what we're doing. And you're, you're my responsibility, but you, you need to tie your stuff up. You can bring your jig and rod. I'm going to look it over. I'll probably cut off whatever you have, put a new leader, a new jig on and say okay but you know this is it and if you break you got to figure it out right type deal but it's hard to change that that mindset of you know because you get guys that are super skillful you don't have to worry about it all right so it's a huge handicap in a sense too having a coangler but it's a oh, good yeah. thing because that's how we're going to get people moving up and yep. into this into this world but then you're going to get the 80 year old guy whose wife got him signed up you know for his birthday <laughs> i think with the demand of co signing up for four tournaments now that's probably going to go away it should it should <clears throat> but know. i failed miserably at that too brian i i just could never get out of guide mode right uh, mm -hmm. guy in the back of the boat and and you know what i'm going to say long-term business success i can't complain about how my tournament career went uh, again would i like these 17ths and 13ths to be sevenths or thirds sure i would but long-term success Making sure that guy got out of my boat with nothing but good to say about me definitely paid bigger dividends than the money I won in the tournaments. And, and I'll stand firm in that for my, the rest of my guide career too, right? It's uh, uh, so what? I, I might have slipped out of the money and not cashed a check, but Joe Brown from wherever in Nebraska that fished with me on day two and watched me pay more attention to him than winning a tournament or watched me do something to move him up in the to standings. Keep him in the money, yep. Whether or not it got <clears throat> me where I needed to be or not, uh, those stories resonated through the co-angler crowd and into the public, and it fills my guide calendar, and it keeps me with sponsors. Uh, so it's a double-edged sword, right? Do you, yep. do you go out there and be a prick? and win money? Or do you go out there and be Brian, the nice guy that you want to be, 
and earn fans and followers and collect your dividends three, four, 10, 20 years down the road, Brian, because I guarantee you, you're going to be just like me. You're going to be done tournament fishing long before you're done working, long yep. before you're done guiding. And that residual effect from getting the right reputation is going to help your business in the end a lot more than first place trophies. And I'm not going to name any names, but there's a handful of people that we can go through and say, wow, this guy's got all these first place trophies and this guy's got all these first place trophies and this guy's got all these first place trophies, but I don't want to spend a day in a boat with this one, this one, or this one, right? I mean, we've heard the stories. We know what goes on out there. The, the reputations precede some of our, of our anglers. And I don't think that's the right business recipe. Might be the best recipe to win tournaments, but not necessarily the the best recipe to win over the heart of others. What's that book? Uh, the ways to uh, win friends and influence others, right? Remember that yep. marketing book? I don't know if you ever read that. I can't yep. remember the exact title, but it might be uh, on that's the one of the books. Behind me there. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. That's one of the books that was rammed down my throat when I was in college. And uh, man, I'm so glad I read it more than once in my life because that's how I make the decisions I made, not just on the water tournament fishing, but in my business altogether is, is this a short-term benefit or is the long-term benefit? And if I'm going to make a mistake, I'm going to go with the long-term benefit every time, every time. Yeah. I've probably read that book a few too many times. It's <laughs> the winning by Jack Welch. That was another good one. That's yeah, a good one. Good one. He, the, the chapter sticks out in my mind is the candid one. Mm -hmm. where you can't fix it if you don't know it's broken right but right. basically as he just comes says it's we just have to speak open and honestly about exactly. things like, this exactly. does not work you know here's right. why we can't so we have to identify problems to come up with solutions let's not identify problems and just bitch about it let's right. solve it right and as a right. military guy that's all we ever did was solve <laughs> problems that's the no goal problem. let's solve right. let's solve the issues that's all good stuff and you know you keep talking on the business aspect of it. And that's exactly what it is for, you know, guys like you and I. And in the walleye world, the reality is most every 98% of these guys have full-time jobs. Right. That in it, and whether it's guiding or TV shows, or it's still not, not all of them are within the industry of their full-time jobs, many for the railroads and what have you, but it's, it's a business. You got to treat this like a business, seeing if it's just the tournament side of it is because it isn't cheap. This is, it's not going to get cheaper. Um, also we have a big demand for co-anglers, but I believe entry fees will, I don't know for a fact, but I'm going to guess they're probably going to go up next year. If you look at the bass world, many of those guys, and there's been articles written recently and a few guys on their YouTube and other things that are starting to put out there. Hey, this is what it cost me this week. Here's what I want. Here's what it cost me. These four That's tournaments. Right. Here's what I want. Here's where I'm at. Right. It's I'm so upside down. If I don't now they got a different deal where they're spending more to get in and 50% of that field's getting paid which is not the case for us, um, right. but we're not paying, you know, half, a little bit less than half what their entry fees are, but it's so sponsorship dollars. Now you've had sponsors and Shields has been a big partner of yours, obviously mm -hmm. a huge ambassador for the Devil's Lake community, which you've worked with them and, and many right. others. Hummingbird, you got the Hummingbird yep. seminars. Um, we'll touch on that in just a second, but let's, let's cover some sponsors and just the business aspect of it. What do you, where do you think that's going? How hard a game is that? Because that's what it is. It's a game, but you know oh, as yeah. well as anybody, you're you're the out. We said this there, but you're you're a salesman for that company, is what you are. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, the game has changed so much. I started in 1994. Uh, did not have a sponsor when I started. Jumped in. Uh, actually, was given a sponsor from the tournament organization. Believe it or not. Uh, uh, the first tournament tour I fished was called the North American Walleye Anglers, yep. which was an equivalent to the PWT, same format, same boat fields. And actually 80% of the guys fished them both anyways. Uh, and Cabela's was running that show. They actually matched me with my first sponsor, uh, which was Igloo Coolers. Uh, I actually still have the only cooler they gave me that year <laughs> the one so, uh, and the whole point of telling this story is because i learned right away that not only did i know nothing about being a sponsored professional angler but sponsors knew nothing about being a sponsor either right, right. Uh, cabela set up this deal with igloo coolers they gave me a contact name uh, back then you couldn't 
uh, you could have sent an email if you were lucky enough to have a home computer. Right, yeah. I was 24 years old, right out of college. I didn't even know how to spell computer, let alone own one. <laughs> I got to run back to uh, campus and use a yeah, computer quick. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So the Commodore 64 um, probably. So Right, right. So I reached out. I finally got a hold of this contact person and I said, so uh, we need to figure out how this is going to work. And the guy said to me, well, Johnny, we know how it works. I gave the money to Cabela's. They gave you a rain suit with my logo on it. You got three shirts that say Igloo on it. And uh, go have the best year you can. And I'm like, but I okay. have a Coleman cooler in my boat that I use every day because that's what I bought and that's what I can afford. Yeah. And the guy goes, well, okay, so what's your point? And I'm like, come on, man. It's you can't cooler. get me an Igloo cooler? <laughs> I, so finally I got an igloo cooler, one, an one. igloo cooler, right? So uh, I learned a lot early. Uh, I think the sponsor companies have learned more over yeah, the years as well. For sure. And then in the middle 90s, you know, 95, 96, 97, uh, it was fairly, I don't want to say, Brian, it was easy to get sponsorships, but it kind of was because if you did it right, you stood so far ahead of the rest of the crowd that it, it, sponsors couldn't ignore you. I mean, they couldn't ignore you, right? Yeah. I remember making a full-color, multi-page resume. I had mar a marketing degree. We had to take some graphic art stuff. I asked for help. I got some good pictures taken. And I made a full-color, four-page resume instead of a black-and-white resume. I sent that to four companies the next year, and all four said, yes, we'll sponsor you, right? Uh, one of them was Tracker Boats. And one of these days, I am going to frame the two letters I have. The year previous, I sent a letter to Tim Lilly. He was the PR guy, promotions uh, sponsorship guy for Tracker Boats. And I got the form letter back saying, Johnny, thanks for your interest. We wish you the best of luck. As a you know, young promising angler, here's the two closest boat dealers to your home, uh, and take this letter and tell them I sent you. Uh, I think that you need to start locally and work your way up the ladder. And almost one year to the day, I have a letter from the same Mr. Tim Lilly welcoming me to my memo build tracker 20 foot fiberglass <laughs> boat. Right? All I changed was my resume, Brian. I was the same person. Yep. I just changed how I presented myself, but so few anglers were presenting themselves properly. So yep. few anglers would take the time to call their local outdoor writer. Now, granted, we didn't have social media. We didn't have YouTube. Yep. We didn't have any of that stuff. But I would get on the phone and call an outdoor writer at home. Well, we fished together the first time. Three weeks later, Johnny, I need a story for Saturday's paper. What are you doing Friday? Nothing. Can you take me fishing? Sure. Next thing you know, every other week or every third week, you're the featured guy in your local newspaper, right? It was easy. Um, go to a tournament, find a writer, get a picture taken, get in the paper, call editors of magazines, right? So I did all that. S springboard sponsorship. Now, man, social media, ooh, what do you do? Everybody can tell their story, right? Everybody can tell their story. We're no longer competing against each other, Brian, for sponsor dollars. You and I are competing for dollars with people that may or may not even know which end of a fishing rod to hold, yeah. but they look really good in said swimwear holding a fish, right? And yeah. it's the same money, man. It's We're competing against things that we might not should be competing against, but yeah. it's reality now, right? So. Uh, I'm so glad I'm winding down my career and starting to wean away from sponsors instead of being the new guy trying to get them. Uh, yeah, fish good, you get attention. That lasts for a while. You still got to carry it through. You got to yeah. sell products. You got to, right? Uh, you talked with Pat and I, and yeah. I was listening to your podcast, and I'm, I actually said it out loud right before you and Pat said it. Nothing happens till something gets sold. I said it out loud in my right. truck, listening to you guys. And how many pro anglers realize that, right? Yeah, yeah, we can sponsor you. You can wear our hat everywhere you go. But if you're not selling Northland jigs or 
you're not getting people in the doors of a shield store, or if I'm not getting people to add another Humminbird head unit to their network, then I'm not going to have a job very long. So really, really tough road. Uh, I mean, it's advice worked. to people getting into it. Forget about fishing if you want to be sponsored, right? Go take marketing classes. Go take public speaking classes. Yeah. Go learn how to write a business letter. Uh, anything you're going to post on social media, you better put your post together and store it for 24 hours and read it again. Right. Uh, I am really, really <laughs> careful about mine. And I've been called on the carpet once or twice about, you can't say that wearing our shirt or you can't do that wearing our hat or, you know what I mean? So yeah. uh, get ready to live your life behind a glass wall because you're not going to get one minute of sleep. You're, my phone rings at 11 o'clock at night and it rang this morning at 645, right? So uh, you're going to be Mr. Public and uh, you better enjoy it or or don't play the game. Well, that's what I think most people forget. And I see it all the time is, you know, they got their truck wrap, boat wrap, whatever, or your jersey on. And I, even if... I, said this to nonprofits on their boards. I'm like, you rep, you know, when you put that on your, your social media profile, you're, te- you've seen the guys with pro staff and they listed 20 things or they work for this company and that company. I said, once you're sharing that on your social platforms, it could be your LinkedIn, your Facebook, and you're telling the world, that's what, who you, that's what you do. That's what you do 24 seven. Oh yeah. You're affiliated with that organization or that company, no matter where you are. So when you park your truck outside of, you know, the, crazy prairie chicken strip club whatever it is <laughs> everybody sees that and knows that and Absolutely. you know the berkeley guys got to get a someone's going to stick a photo of it because everybody's got to ride the hidden camera yep that's not hidden anymore it's in your pocket and go snap and it, they can throw it up on your page but i have a set they're going to send it to your sponsors and just be like oh, i don't you know because for one they're haters and they just right. are insecure jealous that you got something they don't have you know and then two they just people are just that way or some are offended by it and be like i don't you know i think this guy is higher moral character than that and they shouldn't be doing this or you're stumbling out of a bar late at night you just you you got to be smart use your head and right. if you treat it like a business now yeah it means everything and i mean your wife knows it mine does what are you doing i'm, I'm working i'm working it's late right. everything is business i'm going here it's, right. it's all business i need to do this make sure your hair's cut chase is always good at telling us those stories of always be <laughs> shaving when you're doing your seminars you know if you're a clean shaving guy i'm not um but don't go up there with your messy hair you know it's right. look professional be professional but we you know if anybody's an mpa member been to a conference they they've heard that drum beat many and you are i believe the founding one of the founding members of that that yep. created such a great organization to teaches this so people really if you're not paying attention you need to sign up and be start paying attention and go to these exactly. conferences <laughs> to get this insight because it's a business and when you start treating it like a business you're going to be tenfold more successful right yeah, I mean, I can I could make a list, Brian, and with your help, it'd get pretty long of the anglers that should have owned it, right? I mean, mm-hmm. how many guys do we know that could? Oh, as far as just fishing talent, they they made us all look silly and didn't make it as pro anglers, right? Some of them had semi long term careers. Most of them were here for two or three years and gone. Uh, and if they would have just said it's my business. It's my business, right? Uh, uh, Lifestyle choices, right? That's your choice. Uh, I'll never understand why the world thinks that you can't punch out, right? And that doesn't matter what business you're in. Yep. Uh, I I see no problem with the guy having a couple drinks with his buddies after a rec league softball game. I mean, my goodness, that's what life is about. But, you know, we're, we're held a little higher esteem there because of a rap or a logo, which may or may not be fair, but it's reality. But the rest of it, treat as a business, right? Um, it's really kind of fun for a while going into stores, buying the hook out of crankbaits. But is that the smartest business decision you can make, right? I mean, uh, spending gets create crazy out of control on the road. Uh, entry fees are expensive. Traveling is expensive. Uh, I'm sitting in a studio probably similar to what you're sitting in right now that I built during COVID. So I can put on seminars remotely. I'm staring into a three thousand dollar video camera right. with a five hundred dollar loop light behind it, looking at a twenty seven inch monitor with another laptop here, a remote microphone on that costs seven hundred and fifty bucks with a backdrop that, believe it or not, that wood looks old. But I paid a lot of money for wood that looked <laughs> old, right? Yeah. So 
I, I mean, I've got $15,000 probably in my little home office studio because a pandemic happened and I needed to be able to still do my job. Uh, and how many other pro anglers look at it that way? Uh, I tell, told my wife, when I quit, tournam- I quit tournament fishing and we moved to Florida, or I moved part of my business to Florida, and I bought a home in Florida. Uh, I'm right across the water from the Gulf of Mexico, so I'm on a coastal property. And I told my wife, I, she got a little frustrated when I made this business decision. And I said, what's the big deal? The house is free. And she said, yep. what? How can the house be free? And I showed her on paper how much money I spent in tournament expenses every year. And Brian, I'm making money by buying a house in Florida instead of fishing tournaments. That's how expensive the walleye tournament trail was when I quit fishing. So there you have it right there. It's a yeah, lot of I mean, money. Cash in a check is a pretty, a pretty important on the tournament trail, where, even if it's the last check. You're right. like that. That's not even a break-even point at this point, but right. it's something, you know. And and being able to roll that into the next one or keep moving forward is, it's not cheap. So it's you know no. sponsors are important, and I don't. I think a lot of people have a misconception of what those are, and they think we're getting big money. And you know, there's a, I was, there's a difference between pro staff, and sponsored <laughs> anglers, and right. field staff that people don't differentiate themselves apart. Some just want to look like a NASCAR, you know, jersey out there. And there's some that, I mean, that don't do anything for free, but it's right. monetizing it is, is not easy. You better, better be good at the business side of it and, you know, present them with obviously a, a angling plan or a, whatever you want to call it and a resume and a portfolio that makes right. yourself stick out. Well, it's so hard, Brian, to say no, right? Um, right? I think back when I was younger and I got offered deals from X Rod Company or X Real Company or, or Northland way back in the day. Uh, Their management's changed. I don't know how their program works now. But back in the day, they offered me when I made my first championship to be on the Northland pro staff, right? And the deal was, if you wear our hat and finish in the top three, you get cash. Otherwise, you can pay us 50% for all your jigs. And I'm like, wait a second. (laughs) My hat is the only thing anyone sees in an interview, right? Just look at this podcast right now. One logo on the shirt, one on the hat. And I'm going to give my hat up to maybe finish in the top three and get a $500 check and still buy my jigs at half price. And I watched a ton of younger rookie anglers jump all over that when we were offered it, right? Because they had no anything. And uh, I said no to it because I can't pay my bills buying jigs at half price, right? I need to make money at this game. But if you say yes to all those deals, now, when the right deal comes across, uh, are you making that decision because you're loyal to a new company and you believe in their products better? Or now are you chasing dollars? And when you start chasing dollars, you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. And now we go right back to what I said before about long-term business decisions versus short-term business decisions, right? I've watched a lot of pro anglers come and go that over a three-year window made a lot more money than me but they only fished for three years where I've made a career out of it. I've got a house in Devil's Lake, North Dakota that is paid for. I'm purchasing another home in Florida. I have two boats that are paid for. Uh, My tow vehicle is now paid for. Um, And I did it all through a fishing business by making good business choices. It's not so much the emotional choices, not so much chasing the next hot company that might only be here for three years and gone. Uh, and yeah, the, again, I can't urge people any more than to say, go to your local community college, go to your local four-year school. You don't have to get a degree to take a college class, but right. go take some next level classes about marketing, public relations, presenting yourself, yep. public speaking, right? Technology. Go learn it, right? Read the books. Like you said, Brian, there, my bookshelf's not behind me. It's at the other end of the room, but I almost bet that if we went through titles, uh, we'd have more than one or two that match. I, right? I think I have a Johnny uh, Candle book up there even. <laughs> so, uh, you know, go to the NP, the NPAA, right? The conference this yeah. year, I get it. I wasn't there. Only the second one I've missed 
in 20 some years because I had guide trips booked. But go to the conference, right? The I've presented there, you've presented there. Uh, we've had some of the, forget the pro anglers that have presented there. We've had some of the best business minds in the, in the world, right. not even just fishing business, just business minds. The, the Glorvigans used to come present. Holy cow, did those two fishing guys create a business empire, right? The, yep. Unbelievable what, what you can do with a good business plan and a good business program and execute it. And yeah, get away from the fishing, get into the business. And uh, one thing I found, Brian, is when the dollars are there and you don't have to get that check, you fish a lot better. Oh, a yeah. lot better. I mean, a lot better. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Your yeah your your focus and stress levels all you know change a little bit. It's if people would put. I mean, I get it. You got to start somewhere. So if you're starting at the bottom at the fifty percent discount on whatever it is, you know that's fair enough. But there's a point where you got to put value on yourself and the value that you're delivering. And if it's not, you know, equal to what somebody offers you, you just say, no, thanks. Right. You know, they'll come back around if you want them to, or if they wish to usually, I mean, I've said no to, you know, a couple of companies for years because I didn't use the product. Right. You know, but then they gave me some and I tested it out throughout time and eventually was like, yeah, okay. Now something new came out and this is it. I love this stuff. Reach back out to it immediately. They're like, okay, good. You know, just been waiting for you to come right. on board. I'm like, well, you had to get the right stuff to fit my needs, you know, for right. me to be be part of the team. And, and now you do, and I love it, and, it, and it's awesome. But right. it's a business. So, and speaking of the business side of your, you're coming home from Florida, traveling through all these upper Midwest states, putting on the hummingbird seminars. Oh yeah, part of the business in a super smart, lucrative way to, to help shield sponsors, the hummingbird sponsors. You know, and then Johnny himself, obviously. You got any oh, more yeah. of those coming up or are you I do, done? I do. I'm uh I'm about two thirds of the way done. Um the rest of them are all in my home state of North Dakota, which is kind of nice now because I don't yeah. have to put the miles on. <laughs> right. Uh got two coming up in Bismarck, one in Minot and two in Fargo, uh all in the last couple of weeks of March and the first week of April. So uh you can find that information out on uh, shields.com or you can come to one of my social media sites or my personal webpage. Uh, just type my name in Google and it pops oh, right up. It's pretty easy I'll drop find, some of them so. links below in this yeah. on the YouTube. So people, well, can... yeah, those are, those have been uh, a lot of fun. Uh, they're, they're fairly lucrative, right? I mean, no one works for free, so it's, it's a job. Uh, but I, other than the travel and this winter, it hasn't been a big deal because we haven't had bad weather right. to travel through. Uh, but no, other than the travel they're they're a riot. Uh, my classes are pretty unique. I was standing uh, in, at a sports show booth actually years and years and years ago with a gentleman, gentleman named Brian Olmstead who was repping for Humminbird. And we were tr brainstorming, trying to figure out how do you make a seminar that's not what everybody else does. And he said, you know, we do a lot of trainings at Humminbird Corporate where they put units right in front of us. And we can all push buttons. And I'm like, oh my goodness, Brian, if I could do that for the public, we'd own the seminar game, right? So he said, let me do some looking. And he found the right people at Humminbird and they got me some power supplies that I can plug in and power up multiple head units instead of just one at a time. And I'm now doing Humminbird training sessions where people bring their Humminbird into the classroom plug it in and I walk them through what the buttons do, right? And Brian, we all have devices in our life that we'd probably get more out of if we knew what all the buttons did, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we use 20% of this thing's capability. Exactly. It has more technology than the first space shuttle we have at our Exactly, right exactly. So yeah, we sit there for three hours and I walk them through, you know, setup modes and down imaging and side imaging and 2D sonar and how to save waypoints and name waypoints. And right, we go through all these little exercises and they're literally pushing the buttons as I'm talking. So not only do they hear how it works and they see how it works, but they actually do it physically themselves. Uh, hopefully they all go home and practice a little bit more on their own, but at least I know they've all pushed the buttons once or twice and 
the, they're overwhelmingly popular. Most of them sell out within days of being announced. They're like uh, 25 I I can, bucks or something, right? 25, yeah, 25 30 bucks. bucks and, and actually you get your money back because right. Shields give you a $25 gift card. So they're, uh, they're literally free training sessions and, uh, man, they've gone over really well. I wish, I almost hate to say this because you don't like creating competition, but I can't get everywhere. I wish right. somebody else would pick up the pace or maybe do it for someone else. Right. Uh, and again, Humminbird, please don't get mad when I say this, but I don't see anyone else doing it, Brian, for any brand out there. So No, I think uh, Hydra's doing a little bit of stuff for Lorance. Right. Um, I think they've done maybe one or two type of deals just like that, but more or less he's on the water, doing, stuff, um, I think. On right. the water. Right. Um, and I've done that with just a few people who have called and said, hey, I got these birds. I can't figure it out. Can I give you a hundred bucks? I'm like, maybe at the boat ramp, we'll jump in your boat for an hour, help you dial it in. Right. You know, yep. but then it's, but like you said, there's so much more to it. And then you really got to be hands on, you know, right. pushing those buttons, understanding these settings. I like to think I'm pretty good with it, but there's certain things when I get into like the mega chirp stuff and I right. mess with that. I'm like, <laughs> it, it works just fine the way it is. I'm not going to mess with any of those settings. And you know what? That's exactly what I tell them at my class. Don't touch this one. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, because there's a lot of options when you dig down deep in that exactly. thing. And I'm like, it works fine. I don't know that I need to really jack this up because that's what's going to happen. You'll mess with it and you'll never uh, restore defaults. Let me start back there over. There you go. Best button oh. on the machine. <laughs> yep. Yep. I uh, just updated my Mega Live to that. It's like 2.0 2 or 2.3 or something mm -hmm. now. And that made yep. a big, big difference. It, it, um, yeah. The What I saw of it, I put that up update in right before I left Florida to come home and and uh, the ocean maybe isn't the best place because if you can't see those fish on mega live you're in trouble <laughs> right. like, it, I don't care how bad it is you're gonna see them but uh, it my first indications the only got to use it for two or three days but the latest update definitely took it to the next level which is good right uh, as a hummingbird yeah. guy uh, I'm glad to see us get where we need to be uh, and who knows what's next coming? Oh my goodness! Right? That yeah. I love the fact that there's three big players right now, right? And and I wish Garmin and Lawrence the best, and I want them to beat Humminbird in something else because then it makes Humminbird beat them. Yep, right? competition's I mean, good. Could you imagine if there was only the green box still? Because that's all we'd. Right, if Lawrence came out with a green box and no one else ever tried to do sonar, we'd all still be fishing with the green box. Yep. Right, no need to build something better if if this is all that's out there. They're going to buy it forever. Right, so I love the competition. I uh, this forward facing sonar war has been the greatest thing for the electronics <laughs> industry ever. Right, it's, yep. it's incredible what it's creating. So, if you didn't know about it, you uh, you do now. And, exactly. and a lot of it is oh, we're getting record viewership. I'm like, that's because the viewership is people debating the forward facing sonar, but whatever. Exactly. They're engaged and they're paying attention and they're watching. Right. And if you watch right. the Red Cat, Red Crest finals yesterday where yep. was DC won again, locked in on that thing. And oh, yeah. And it, I mean, hands down, I mean, most all the guys are theoretically doing a lot of the same stuff. Right. They're throwing the same I baits we've been throwing for years. It. Right. I yeah. wish I was good at it. I really do. Um, I, I have no problem with guys using it. Right. I think it's yep. great. I love the tournaments, uh, staring at the back of a guy's head. I get that part. Is it all that much fun? No, but you know what, Brian, you stare at the been back doing of for years. Head. anyways, right? right. Just, you talk, now they're talk, just looking down instead of up. It's not that's that what big. I, you talk to any cameraman, he'll say, this is the same angle I've had forever. The difference that I told some of the other day is now they're so focused on it. They're not right. able to cast, turn and talk, you know, right. kind of engage. Now they're up because right. they're trying to watch it all and work it. So that's, you know, the little difference, but you're still seeing yeah. it's a, you know, camera right. guys are butt photographers. That's that's oh, yeah. it. That's what their yeah. frame is. Right. Oh. What I love about it is uh, what it's allowed me to do when I'm not casting. Right. I, I hear a lot of people talk about, you know, I want to track my lure. I want to track my jig, yeah. see a fish, see them react. I get that. Right. I've done that a couple of times. Uh, I'm more like I believe you are where I just want to know where they're at in relation to my yeah. boat so I can get in a general direction. But yep. Where I've really become dependent on it is dragging stuff, right? If I'm pulling a Lindy rig or I'm dragging a bottom bouncer and a spinner or slow death, I am no longer fishing. I have become a 22 foot German short hair pointer, right? right? I, I mean, literally, I have. I will. I find myself up on a flat or on a on an edge or a long tapering point, 
And instead of staring at my depth finder to stay exactly 12 feet deep, I'm constantly snaking around looking for the next pot of fish. And when I find them, I just follow them till I get over the top of them. Are you using a trolling then, motor transducer yeah, to follow? Yeah, or you got a, a motor? Because a lot of guys I'm are doing the, the same yeah. with a pole and then watching right. a bait behind them. Right. You know, right. Like no, a three I'm way. looking ahead of me for the fish. Yep. Yep. And I'm just S curve, S curve. Oh, there's a pot of fish off to my left. So I'll point at them. And when you lose them, that means they went either right or left out of your cone. So right. you scan a little. Oh, they went to the right little further to the right, little further to the right. And then I'll see them go from my live to my 2D sonar. That means I'm yep. right over them. And I'll tell the guys in the back Boom. of the boat, you better get ready. Next thing you know is, oh, crap, I missed one. Oh, I got one. And yep. they go, how'd you know those were there? And my answer is, I'm a fish whisperer. I just kind of <laughs> know where they're at. Right. But I've been chasing them around. Now, yep. the scary part is, and again, it's putting your face down in that screen, right? Yeah. You better have somebody looking out for boats for you because I've come really, really close <laughs> a couple of times to just T bone and right into somebody, right? Yeah. I've had I'm people staring down close at the screen going, nope, they're over here. They're over there. They're over there. Oh, oh. And then you look up and you're like, oh, crap. I'm sorry, dude. I didn't. My yep. bad. Let me get out of your way. I'll try a gold spinner. They're really biting those and I'll turn and go the other <laughs> right, direction, right? Because right I, I wasn't watching my surroundings. So it is dangerous that way. But Brian, it's, these it's cool. this forward facing sonar technology is not just for pitching to a fish. Oh, no. It's not just for suspended crappie fishing, right? We have not even touched how this is going to change the way we fish, right? Uh, I've heard guys using it on the Great Lakes as side imaging because it's you know. a little different than side imaging, right? They're pointing their trolling motor or their pole 90 degrees to the boat. And when they see a pot of fish, they're actually trying to steer their planer boards to go over that pot of fish now, or right? Bring their baits up to four feet below right. the surface well, instead exactly. of twenty feet down. Exactly. Because your two D so, isn't gonna isn't gonna show that. Right. You know. Right. At Schilling there, they talked to him, and they, a lot of these guys were putting them on the back of their transoms and shooting forward. Right. So now they can see. So if they're trolling, now you can see the right the, the break line, the treetops, yep. whatever, before you get to it. And so you're positioning better. I'm like, yeah, I've heard that's bass smart. guys putting them on their jack plates, right? Yeah, I've yeah, heard of that too. So four or five transducers. It's uh, right. It's pretty cool stuff. I do just save like you did. I don't track my lure with it. Now with the update, I can track it better. But it's right. really okay. That's those aren't rocks. Those are fish. They're moving, and especially on the river, the whole bottom of the you know the river oh, yeah. is just alive. Right. Um, but there's so many fish. It's like don't don't chase one. Just there's fish there. Just start fishing. You're, right. I mean, you can just drop it down. Okay. okay? You're missing fish. Uh, but it's, you know, I'll find one and, and make a cast. Then it's always, then you're, you know, scanning for the next cast while you're working that back. Mm -hmm. You know, I could, mm -hmm. I got St. Croix and Seagar Smackdown line. I could feel any bite that, oh, that yeah. happens. Yep. You know, I don't need to, to watch it happen. So, right. It is cool. It's definitely changing the game and uh, we're all just adapting with it and doing the best we can. We've been uh, chit chatting for quite a while now. Let's, I want to, a little bit about Florida. Tell everybody about what you got going on in Florida. So if they want to get out of this crappy cold Dakota weather, they want to head yeah. south. Yeah. What, they, so, what can uh, they expect? Yeah, I gave up the tournament game a couple years ago. And uh, long before I did that, I had started thinking, what am I going to do after I tournament fish? Uh, there is going to be a lack of uh, income that has to be replaced, not from my winnings, but uh, the sponsor dollars are starting to decline a little. Uh, it's one thing to to work with a current tournament pro, uh, you can only pay the word retired for so long, right? Yep. And I understand yep. that. I, I have no issue with that. My my visibility is still there, but it's different visibility now, right? So um, I started searching years ago uh, along the Gulf of Mexico. I knew that's where I wanted to go. I heard a lot of great things about the fishing down that way. Started in Venice, Louisiana, which I still think is the greatest Oh, my favorite um, place. Fishery on the planet, right? If if I didn't have a wife involved in this decision, I would be in Venice, Louisiana right yeah, now. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a, kind of a tough place to take your wife and say, <laughs> yeah. you sit here while I go fish, because she might not be there when you get home, right? It's, no, it's, you uh, either fish or you work on an oil rig. Pretty much. You know, that's it. There's yep. no reason to be down there other than that, but it is exactly. awesome fishing. So I started moving east. Uh, 
and got through uh, Mississippi, not so pretty there. Alabama, Gulf Shores was kind of nice, yeah. but it's really spendy. Um, and then a good friend, and I think you know her as well, Christine Hellman, oh, yep. reached out to me and said, hey, I've got this rental home, and I'm following your adventures as you move across the Gulf of Mexico. I've got this rental home in this little town of Carabel, Florida. I think you should check it out. I'll give you a really good deal on the rental. So I did, and I hired a fishing guide down there, and after about 45 minutes, I'm like, wow, this could be the place. I've been in this little community for about three days. I fished for an hour at the most, and I'm sold. The fishing was great. The community is uh, small and quaint, 1,200 people in the little town of Carabel, Florida. Uh, they call that stretch of the Gulf the Forgotten Coast because there is no big attraction. I'm 90 miles east of Panama City, and I'm still two and a half hours north of Tampa, Florida. So I'm right okay. in that stretch where there really isn't anything but fishing, but yet it's not so run down and dirty and oil yeah. rigged like that you don't want to be there. So it's a really good blend. Uh, those of you that have followed along see that we catch some pretty nice fish there. Uh, speckled trout fishing can be good inshore. Red fishing can be good. Uh, we put the biggest one I've ever touched in my boat this last winter at 43 inches long. So that's an absolute giant. Uh, and then if the weather is nice enough and I can get offshore or what they call near shore, uh, I can be in 80 feet of water inside nine miles from land, which is a short ride in the ocean to get that deep. Yeah. And that lets me catch snapper and grouper and amberjack and triggerfish and sea bass and, and about 473 other species yeah. that I still don't know what half of them right. are. Right. So uh, it's a lot of fun. I'm down there in the winter months. Um, it's not Key West. I'm not going to lie about that. It's not, you know, 85 and sunny and no wind every day. It's, they still have a little bit of winter in North Florida. But it's 65 degrees instead of 35 right. below zero. So it's, uh, it's been a great fun for me. I'm still learning a lot. I'm not going to say I'm the best saltwater charter boat captain down there, but I do work really hard. And I've been able to provide some pretty good results so far. And Brian, what I love about it is my clientele so far has been people I already know, right? They're customers from up north that want to come down south. Uh, so it's, it's been really fun that way. Uh, my home is large enough that I house my clients with me. I have a five bedroom house. So I give them the downstairs. They've got a laundry room, a bathroom, two bedrooms, a TV. What else do they need? And, yep. uh, and I know they're not going to be late for fishing in the morning because right. they're, they're in the basement. So yeah, it works out really well. No, I'm sure they really well. enjoy the hell out of it. And there's so many destinations in Florida and things to do. It's probably nice to get away from that hustle bustle and a quieter community, which has, I'm sure, some phenomenal little shops and boutiques oh, yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And I, yeah. but Christina tried to get my wife to go down and take photos of that of her place okay. too, and it just didn't work out for our schedule. So we didn't get to go down there, but I've seen, you know, prior to you going down there, plenty of stuff about it. Yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, we, we need to go down there for the weekend just to yeah. go. She's, you'll yeah. save deal. Go spend the weekend there and just in exchange, give me some photos, you know, for our marketing, but it just right. had a little window and it just didn't work out. But right. it looks like a, pretty cool little community and once the locals even within florida find out about it a little bit more i'm sure you'll get some more people from down right. south or up north coming right. over just for that but it's winter right and, and what's really fun about it is uh it's all relative so you and i and everybody we know uh you get down there and it's 65 degrees and we're like oh it's a beautiful fishing day let's go <laughs> right. and i'm the only trailer at the boat ramp in december and january I right suppose, November. Yeah. There's still some locals. And by the time I leave to come home at the end of February, the locals are starting to show up again. But December and January, Brian, no exaggeration. The, the guy at the bait shop looks at me and goes, are you sure you don't hate these fish? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, you got to hate them to go out there and catch them in weather like this. And I'm like, buddy, this is a beautiful June day yeah, in Devil's Lake, North Dakota, right? 65 degrees, 10 mile an hour wind. How? It doesn't get much better. No. Right? So uh, I have it all to myself. I enjoy it a lot, and and I'm looking forward to growing that. And and who knows, Brian? Someday I might just say uh, half the year down there instead of just a couple months. I, I don't know. I don't know where it's going to go. So we'll see. But it's 
another good business plan. It's set up. You set up, you looked right. ahead, you got a plan, and that and that's successful and it's proven successful down there. Right. 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 And you got a much more populated area. So obviously yep. if you can get people from north or south or even upper midwest to come down there, if you're there in the summer, it's not going to be too hard to attract, you know, all the the tourists right. and stuff that are coming through right. and Absolutely. I'll spend a day on the water and, and catch some reds and, and speckled trout, which really kind of like walleye almost in a oh, sense. Yeah. And yep. Taste good and they taste about the same. Pretty uh, much. And you can catch them the same. Oh yeah. Same Jigging. rod, same right. reel, same <laughs> jig, same tail. Twenty inch fish and yep. Yep. The off, only difference you know. is at the end of the day, you have to spray the salt off of everything. <laughs> Other than that, a, a speckled trout and a walleye are, they're pretty much exactly the same, exactly the same fish. If your limit's probably like 20 a day down there, I'm sure. And yeah, yeah, it's higher. This, it's higher. That's what and, it is in uh, Venice. <laughs> yeah, and they're easy to catch. And like you said, they clean up nice. They fillet <laughs> real easy. They taste real good. So, uh, and then those big bull redfish, oh, I'm telling you what. That's my favorite. There's a whole other podcast right there, Brian. Yeah. But if you've never caught a redfish, you owe it to yourself to take your walleye rod. And I'm not yep. exaggerating. Yep. Seven foot, medium fast, size 3,000 reel of your choice. Put some 20-pound braid on it and a 30-pound leader with a, with a quarter-ounce jig and a swim bait. And just go start casting to anything that looks like it should have a fish next to it. First. 30 inch or bigger redfish you right. catch, you might not come home. It's they, that, it's and that they taste amazing. Oh, yeah. Grill them on the skin of the red oh, yeah. half shell yeah. and on it the just half flakes. Shell. That's the best. <laughs> I didn't even know how to cook it. And the first time I, I cooked one up, I had a couple of them. I'm like, this is, oh, yeah. this is good. This is yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah. They was, are by so... far my favorite fish that swims anywhere, right? I mean, yep. uh, very few fish bite that hard, get that big, and taste that good, right? Yep. Uh, one thing I know, Florida, you're not allowed to keep an oversized fish, but uh, Louisiana, you're allowed one over 27 inches 27. a day. Yep. And the guides don't balk at keeping them. And I'm like, are you sure? And the guy's like, well, they taste exactly the same as the little ones. And I'm like, yeah. no, there's no way. No way. They can't, right? Every other fish, when it gets big, tastes right, it gets horrible. Gross. <laughs> not a redfish, man. If them things got 400 pounds, I'd keep a 400 pounder. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are amazing. <laughs> they are yeah. good. <laughs> they are good. All right. Well, let's wrap this up, John. If you could leave one little tip or nugget, which I think you've left a ton of them throughout this podcast with our uh, listeners, what uh, what is it out there? Well, you think? I, I I thought about this a lot when you sent that. You, you know, you like to leave a nugget, and your other guests have done it too, and everybody's given great ones. And there's so many. How do you leave one? <laughs> but, right. uh, my wife sucked me into this Ted Lasso show, right? And I'm sure yeah, you've yeah, seen yeah. it and other people have seen it. And I don't get moved. Well, I do. I'm a pretty emotionally emotional guy, but I don't get moved by a comedy show very often, right? But one of the episodes, and I think it's towards the beginning when Ted Lasso's talking to his kid and he uh, tells him to be a goldfish. I don't know if you can remember yep, that episode or not, but I'm sitting in my living room watching this comedy show bawling like a baby because Ted Lasso explained to his kid to be a goldfish. And uh, the whole point, if you haven't seen the show, is that goldfish are the happiest creatures on earth because they only have a 10-second memory. And how many times have I had to remind myself to have a 10-second memory? And I didn't even realize I was doing it, right? Uh, one of my phrases that I like to use all the time is, 100 years from now, no one's going to know this even happened, right? And the point is, no matter how bad or how miserable or how big of a mistake you think you made, be a goldfish. Because once 10 seconds goes by, it doesn't matter anymore. Whether you're tournament angling and you break a fish off and you get mad, you've got a choice to make. You can let that wreck the rest of your tournament day, or you can take 10 seconds, forget about it, tie another jig on, and go finish catching your limit, right? Uh, maybe you posted something on social media that someone didn't like. And yeah, it's there forever, but not really. You can delete it, ignore it, and 10 seconds later, it's gone. It's in the past. We can't go back and fix things. There's been a lot of things in my life, Brian, I'm sure in your life too, that, oh, if I could do it over again, oh, don't, yeah. don't kid yourself. <laughs> don't kid yourself, list. right? I mean, I live in North Dakota, kind of, sort of, because of a decision I made that yeah. a lot of people would say, man, I wish I could do that over again. But if I would have dwelled on that, 
20, 25 years ago now when I got divorced and started a whole new life in a place where I knew no one other than my ex-wife's family, where would I have been sitting at home worrying about it or developing into the business and the career I've got now? So uh, again, I probably should uh, sign some disclaimer so Ted Lasso's production <laughs> company doesn't sue me. But I think that that be a goldfish, man, right? Yeah, that's make, Don't be afraid to make a mistake because if you don't make mistakes, you're not trying. And when you make a mistake, forget about it. Move on, right? The, your friends aren't going to quit being your friends because you made a mistake. Uh, you might lose a business relationship here or there because you made a mistake, but you'll find another one down the road and just live life, make mistakes, forget about it, move ahead. And you're going to be much further in the end than sitting there dwelling on things for, for days or weeks or months or years, right? So be a goldfish. Couldn't have said it any better. That's the <laughs> words of wisdom from the fishing educator, the professor himself, Johnny Candle, wrapping it up here today for us. And uh, true, that's true stuff, right? Just forget it, move on, and quit d- dwelling in the past. So, uh, yeah, Ted Lasso stuff's pretty funny. I, I don't, I'm not a big <laughs> soccer fan, but it makes you kind of no. – Want to it was go. a good show, though. <laughs> it's a good show. It's pretty funny. That guy's a that guy's a riot. So, yeah. all right, folks. For thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Johnny, for your time today and uh, sharing that massive wealth of wisdom with us all and all the listeners out there. You guys, if you're watching this, you're watching it over on the Walleye Guys YouTube page or on the Walleye Guys Facebook page, and you can catch this on Spotify, Amazon, Google. Apple, I think wherever those podcast platforms are, we are out there for you to listen to. And uh, thanks for tuning in for this week's episode of Real Talk Fishing with No Limits with our special guest, Johnny Candle. And we will see you on the water.